Good morning, everyone. My name is Maya Luria, and we are here uh, talking about Heart Month, and specifically today, women and heart disease. I would like to introduce, I've got Brittany Marcano here with me today. She is an RN. She also oversees the cardio, she's a cardiovascular services coordinator for Tucson Medical Center. Welcome, Brittany. Hi, thank you. So you may be watching us today on either our YouTube channel or one of our Facebook pages. So if you have any comments, questions for Brittany when she is done with her presentation, I'll be I'll go ahead and ask those of her. So please be sure to leave those in the comments for us. Brittany, I'm going to go ahead and let you get started here. And okay. I just pulled your presentation up. You should be ready to go. All right. Thank you so much, Maya. Um, so thank you for the introduction. My name is Brittany and a cardiovascular services coordinator at Tucson Medical Center. Um, so I work with heart attack patients as well as patients that have other types of heart disease like uh, heart failure, valve problems, um, rhythm issues, um, but overall just heart disease in general is what we're going to talk about. Um, and I'm going to be giving you some tools um, and risk factors and facts on how to reduce your risk uh, related to heart disease. So heart disease is the number one leading cause of death for, of women in the United States. Uh, that is, um, it, it is also the leading cause of death for men. So a lot of women don't realize that they have the same leading cause of death as men. About every 25 seconds, an American will have a coronary event. And every 39 seconds, as someone dies from heart disease or stroke, um, about 56% of adults have been told from their healthcare provider to improve their health. Um, and 83% of people believe that heart attacks can be prevented. However, a lot of those people are not motivated to do anything about it. Um, so I hope that with this presentation, we will provide you with some motivation um, to reduce your risk factors. So one third of those heart attack victims do not reach the doctor. And that is what contributes to that um, person dying every 39 seconds. Uh, about 60% of people don't know their blood pressure and their cholesterol numbers, which is a huge risk factor. Um, average blood pressure is 120 over 80. And prehypertension, which is that pre-high blood pressure, uh, reading is 120 to 129 and a diastolic, which is that that bottom number greater than 80. Um, that what's considered hypertensions um, is 130 over 80 or higher. So really understanding your blood pressure um, can decrease your risk by about 50%. Also understanding your cholesterol numbers can also contribute to lowering your risk. Um, cholesterol, total cholesterol number should be less than 200 and is considered de desirable for most adults. Um, 200 to 239 is considered borderline and 240 and above is considered high. And that's for total cholesterol. Um, for that LDL, which is what we consider the bad cholesterol, that should be less than 100. So if you wanna lower your risk, make sure that you know those numbers. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about risk here as well. So heart disease th is throughout the United States. You can see on this map from the CDC, um, there isn't really one area that is not affected. Uh, leading cause of death in both men and women and one in four men will have heart disease and one in f and five women will have heart disease. About one in 16 uh, women over the age of 20 will have coronary heart disease. And 20 sounds pretty young, um, but it can, it can start early depending on those risk factors. So a couple of things I want to make you aware um, and see if maybe you were aware of these. If, if you were, then great. If not, then this is maybe an eye-opening experience for you. Uh, heart disease kills more American women than all forms of cancer combined, including breast cancer. And a women's lifetime risk for developing heart disease is more than one in two. Um, as you age, that risk increases. 
about 60% of women that die suddenly from coronary heart disease had no previous symptoms. Um, so it may not, you may not be aware that you have heart disease until you have a major cardiac event. So really understanding what you can do to prevent that event uh, is key. Uh, many women of color are more likely to develop risk factors and are at higher risk of death from heart disease, but are less likely to recognize their risks. And women that have a general awareness about heart disease are more than more likely to have a positive impact on their family's health as well as their own health. Because as you know, most of our most women are caring for their husbands, they're caring for their children, their grandchildren. And so if you make healthy choices, then you're also helping them make healthy choices as well. So how can you tell if you're at risk? Um, there's some risk factors that you don't have control over, and there's some risk factors that you do. Um, so some of the risk factors that you cannot control are age, um, being postmenopause, family history, and race. Um, many of those can affect your chance of developing heart disease, um, but that's not anything that you can really change. So if you know that you have those risk factors that you cannot control, then you should focus on the factors that you can. Um, so having diabetes, uh, smoking, high, having high blood pressure, high cholesterol, obesity, and inactivity. Those are all things that you do have control over. And if you do have those risk factors, then focusing on trying to reduce those is going to be key, especially if you have a lot of those risk factors that are that you cannot control that are over there on the left. So it's important to understand what you what you can change to lower your risk of having heart disease. So I have some information that I pulled from a resource called CardioSmart. That is a, um, it's both a website and an application that you can download. And they have a lot of these great flyers um, that I really like that give a lot of great information. Um, one of these is uh, Women Heart Disease for Be Your Own Hero that talks about really specific female health concerns. Um, so health problems during pregnancy, such as gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, which is that high blood pressure in pregnancy, and preterm delivery um, are those health problems that can present related to heart disease in pregnancy. Additionally, having many ovarian cysts, such as polycystic ovarian disease, can place women at risk for developing heart disease, breast cancer, and taking oral both birth control, uh, especially if you smoke, can raise that risk. Inflammatory diseases such as lupus or rheumatoid arthritis are more common in women and can lead also uh, increase the risk of developing heart disease. So what can you do about it? Um, you can get screened every year. Make sure that you don't ignore any of those symptoms that may be presenting themselves such as uh, light chest pressure, shortness of breath, um, maybe even what you think is uh, heartburn, or acid reflux could be symptoms that um, of heart disease that we don't want to be ignored because uh, they can develop into something much worse. On, on that bottom uh, of that flyer is that women who served in military have higher rates of heart disease that's thought to be related to um, the occupational stress. Um, so stress is something that can raise blood pressure and then also in turn, um, increase the risk of heart disease. So about 47% of Americans have at least one of those risk factors that we talked about, that high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and smoking. Um, I also included a calculator there down below, um, cvriskcalculator.com. It is something that you can calculate your own 10-year 10, 10 risk score. Um, and that's something that you can talk about with your healthcare provider. I wanted to go also into a little bit more detail about diabetes. Um, diabetes increases the risk of heart disease. It's two times higher the risk in men and four times higher the risk in women. And diabetes affects about one in 10 people in the US. 
and heart disease, just like with all women in the United States, is the leading cause of death. But it is um, the leading cause of death of adults with diabetes specifically as well. So high blood sugar um, can cause blood vessel damage. The sugar is irritating to the inside of the heart vessels, and it can lead to heart disease such as heart attacks, strokes, and peripheral artery disease, so those arteries down in your, in your legs specifically. Um, people with diabetes can also have heart risk factors such as high blood pressure, high cholesterol, lack of inactivity, uh, lack of activity, sorry, and obesity or being overweight. Um, so if you do have, if you do have diabetes, um, they have this uh, plan called follow the ABCs of diabetes, that A being that hemoglobin A1C. It's a lab value that we can draw to measure how well your glucose has been controlled over the last three months, lowering blood pressure and lowering cholesterol as well. Of course, quitting smoking can assist in lowering risk of heart disease. Taking the medications that you've been prescribed for your diabetes, as well as for your blood pressure and your cholesterol can be helpful in reducing your risk. And of course, eating more fruits and vegetables and being active for 30 minutes, five times a week is extremely helpful in reducing that risk. So when we're talking about risk factors with heart disease, I want to emphasize the fact that risk factors don't just add potential danger like one plus one equals two, they actually multiply. So if you have one risk factor um, versus three risk factors, it's not just three times the risk, it's actually 10 times the risk because each factor that is added on multiplies the risk of your heart of heart disease. So if you know that you have um, more risks than, um, and one of those being controllable, then there's, uh, there's potential of being able to make changes in your lifestyle to try to reduce your risk of developing heart disease. So I wanted to go over symptoms and warning signs uh, because a lot of women present differently with heart disease than men. Not all heart attacks are sudden or intense, not like they are portrayed in movies and in t television shows. Most heart attacks actually start out slowly with mild pain and discomfort. Um, most heart attack symptoms, the most common heart attack symptom is chest pain or discomfort. However, not all women will experience that. Women are more likely to experience signs and symptoms unrelated to chest pain, uh, such as shortness of breath, nausea and vomiting, back and jaw pain, uh, pain in other areas of the body, such as the abdomen, stomach, arms, um, unusual fatigue, and unusual chest discomfort. So instead of it being a, a pressure that is described by a lot of men or that crushing type of chest pain, a lot of women will report sharp chest pain or burning chest pain. And sometimes we think that that's just acid reflux or, um, or food poisoning. And we want to make sure that if we are experiencing those types of symptoms, um, that we don't ignore them. If we take a, an acid reducer and it doesn't go away and it actually gets worse, start thinking that maybe it's something more and it could possibly be your heart and reach out for help. So we want to make sure that you're alert for atypical symptoms. Um, the American College of Cardiology has a mnemonic called EHAC, which is a life hack for early, early heart attack care. Um, and it's talking about those atypical symptoms that I just described, um, especially common in women. Um, they're also extremely common in diabetics and in older adults. Um, so some of those symptoms can be a feeling of fullness. So maybe it's not what you would describe as pressure, but it just feels your chest and your abdomen feels full. Um, pain that travels down one or both arms, jaw pain, excessive fatigue or weakness, anxiety or that feeling of something that's wrong, um, nausea, vomiting, back pain, shortness of breath, and then of course that chest pressure, squeezing, aching, and burning sensations 
Uh, some of these symptoms can even be present two weeks before the heart attack happens. So if you are experiencing these symptoms, make sure you're reaching out to get help. Um, get Go to the hospital to get a cardiac workup done, and you could potentially prevent yourself from having a heart attack. Also, outside of just yourself, also with your own family members, if you're hearing that they're complaining of these types of symptoms, really encourage them to go and get checked out. Um, if we can possibly prevent their heart attack, then that's, that's going to be the best thing that we can do for them. Then, of course, if you are having symptoms of a heart attack, don't drive yourself um, and don't ask a friend to drive you. Don't put them in the position of possibly having to um, be in an emergency situation with you where the, if you're not able to breathe on your own, make sure that you call 911 in the scenarios. You don't want to be driving and you also don't want to put your friends and family in such a situation in the car. So visiting your doctor regularly at least once a year um, is key and nothing replaces a discussion with your doctor or health provider. And really be honest about your risk factors so that you can get a realistic assessment and help your doctor develop a plan to lower your overall risk for heart disease. So I've included some example questions of what you can ask your doctor. So for example, what tests should I have and how often should I monitor my risk factors for developing heart disease and stroke because they are also related? Um, what do my test results mean if you've already had test results, whether that's a lab value or a stress test? Do I have heart disease? Uh, what is the difference between heart disease, heart attack, and heart failure? What sort of plan do you recommend for me to lower my risk? Can you help me plan a safe weight loss and exercise program? And what are the possible side effects of the medications I've been prescribed? So I'll go into more detail on some of these, um, such as the difference between heart disease, heart attack, and heart failure. And we'll talk also about uh, some ways that you can lower your, your risk, um, such as a weight loss program, a diet program, and um, this, what tests that can be done to diagnose heart disease. So in order to diagnose heart disease, we typically use uh, an electrocardiogram, also called an ECG, or you also hear it called an EKG. Um, labs such as cholesterol, um, hemoglobin A1C, that's that long-term measurement of uh, glucose or sugar control in diabetics, and heart enzymes. Specifically, we have an enzyme that's called troponin, which is released when the heart is under stress, such as when you're having a heart attack, or it can be just a, the troponins can be elevated when you have a small blockage that has not quite caused a heart attack yet, but it is causing stress on the heart. Stress tests, um, such as a treadmill or a drug um, that can be given to you as through the IV to cause stress in the heart. And then that uh, EKG is measured afterwards. They can also do what's called an echocardiogram, which is like an ultrasound of the heart. That's frequently done as well with those stress tests. Um, so after that, especially after that chemical is, is given um, through the IV to cause that stress of the heart, um, they do do scans usually using nuclear medicine um, to take a look at the heart and how well it's beating and how well the blood is getting pumped out of the heart to see if there's any areas of concern where maybe the heart is not getting as much blood as it should. And that can be seen um, with with those scans done after that chemical is injected. Um, the echocardiogram, that ultrasound of the heart, specifically looks at the movement of the muscle um, to see if there's any part of the muscle wall that is not moving as well that could show us that a heart attack has occurred or that it's not getting the correct blood flow. Um, we can also use echocardiograms to diagnose valve disorders in heart disease. Um, 
that CAC CT scan is something to check for calcium in the heart. Um, that's something that your provider can order to see um, if you do have blockages currently in your arteries in your heart that could place you at risk for having a heart attack. Um, specifically, a lot, of, a lot of cardiologists will order that for patients that do have high cholesterol that maybe is not responding to treatment or that has gotten higher over a short period, period of time. And lastly, the angiogram is a procedure that we do in the hospital um, using catheters to inject contrast into the heart arteries to see if there are blockages in the heart. And if there is, then the, the cardiologist can place a stent to open that blockage in the heart. So how do we treat heart disease? There's several treatment options that can be discussed with your doctor to decide what works best for you. In all of those treatment options, lifestyle modification is going to be one of them. So nutrition, uh, increasing exercise, decreasing or eliminating smoking, uh, hopefully eliminating, and decreasing alcohol intake, and also decreasing stress. So that alcohol and stress is related to blood pressure. Um, both of those can increase your blood pressure, and if it's increased over a long period of time, it can cause stress on the heart. Medications to lower blood pressure and medications to lower cholesterol um, can be prescribed by your doctor to treat heart disease. And also they can prescribe medications that improve the heart pumping function. They can also prescribe aspirin and other medications such as Plavix. Um, there are others out on the market there, such as Berlinta and Effiant, that can prevent blood clots. Those are different than anticoagulants that are prescribed for atrial fibrillation, which is a rhythm problem that can cause clots and can throw clots to your brain to cause strokes. So that prevention and blood clots for heart disease is a little bit different. It works a lot like the aspirin, and it helps to prevent those clots from, um, from forming in those, cardio those coronary arteries. And they can also prescribe medications to manage symptoms such as chest pain. In the hospital, a lot of times we call that angina. Uh, coronary angioplasty or stenting, that would be part of that angiogram procedure that is done in the, in the hospital to open those blocked arteries. And if that's not possible, if there's, a lot of, um, if there's a lot of blockages or the blockages are too severe to be fixed with angioplasty or stenting, open heart surgery can be done, um, which in the hospital we call that coronary bypass grafting. Um, where they can take a vein from your leg or they can take an artery from your arm um, and kind of make like a little different road in your heart to provide blood flow. And then lastly, cardiac rehabilitation is extremely helpful, especially for those that have had stenting done or that open heart surgery done. Um, that a lot of um, coronary, a lot of cardiac rehabilitation um, is used by uh, monitoring the heart rhythm while on a treadmill, but they also have bicycles and hand bikes that can be used. It's really any way to get your heart rate up in a healthy fashion. And then they also monitor that heart rhythm and that heart rate to make sure that you're in a safe zone. So what can you do um, to, to not only treat heart disease, but also prevent yourself from developing it? So I uh, have some recommendations specific to nutrition and specific to um, exercise. So eating a healthy diet rich in fruit and vegetables and lean protein. So those would be like the chicken, uh, fish, lean cuts of red meat. Um, as well as healthy fats. So when I talk about healthy fats, I mean like avocado, fish, uh, olive oil, walnuts, um, any, a lot of nuts are healthy in those healthy fats. Um, pumpkin seeds and also lots of other seeds are, are health, include healthy fats as well. Um, so like if you're going to be having a salad, maybe instead of putting like ranch dressing on it, you could do olive oil and balsamic vinegar, 
Um, maybe instead of croutons, you could put um, walnuts or pecans on it to give it that extra crunch. Um, there's a lot of different ways to modify your meals um, to make them heart healthy um, and still provide you with that, um, that taste that maybe you're looking for, or even that texture, like that crunch. Um, reducing processed foods and added sugars are, is also important. So I'm making sure that you're turning around um, those boxes and cans of foods that are pre-prepared um, and looking at those labels. So watch out for hydrogenated oils. Um, also be careful with high sugar cereals and added sugars. Uh, if you look at those food labels, it'll tell you total sugar and right underneath of it, it'll say added sugar. Um, so just really be cognizant of what you're eating. And if you see that you're eating a lot of those processed foods, try to see if there's any replacements that you can make. So if it's um, you're used to eating cereal in the morning, um, maybe try to swap that out with something that doesn't have as much added sugar in the cereal um, and add fruit to it possibly. Um, reducing added salt in your diet. The reason I bring this up is because water, fo water follows salt into your bloodstream and can raise blood pressure. Uh, that's extremely important for those that have heart failure because um, heart failure depends on a lot of uh, fluid restriction. So we don't want you to drink as much fluid. Um, and with that, we don't want you to have as much salt because the salt can make that fluid go into your bloodstream more easily and it can um, stress the heart. Reducing stress is also helpful, not only for that blood pressure, but um, it's going to just take some time for you. So one of my favorites is meditation. Um, there's a lot of great apps out there and online um, resources that are available for meditation. My favorite is one called Headspace. Um, it's maybe five, 10 minutes um, of my day. It's really good for in the morning or at night to kind of ground yourself um, and really exercising regularly um, and just 30 minutes a day. And it doesn't have to be extremely vigorous, uh, walking, yoga, um, aerobics, anything that you really like. Just um, make sure that you you keep um, your exercise fun so that you don't feel like you're in a rut and then just stop doing it. That's one of the things that is really helpful for me. If I walk the same path every day, then maybe after a couple of weeks, I get a little tired of it. So if I walk the same path and then do something different other days, I may be more apt to do that workout more often and more regularly. And then, of course, health screening every year. So knowing your blood pressure and your cholesterol is extremely important, making sure that you're going to your doctor so you can talk about those numbers. So I talked a little bit about heart failure, um, and I wanted to provide some more information about that. Um, heart failure is a problem with the way your heart pumps. There's two types, um, there's systolic and there's diastolic. So just like our blood pressure, so that systolic is that top number and that means the heart is squeezing. Um, that diastolic, that bottom number, that means the heart is relaxing. So with those two types of heart failure, you have a type of heart failure that uh, doesn't allow the, the heart to pump or squeeze enough blood out to the rest of the body and the heart is really weak. Um, that type of heart failure is very common after heart attacks. Um, we also have diastolic heart failure, which is that resting, and that's where the heart can't fill with enough blood. It's too stiff. It can't relax and fill up. Um, and those are more, more prominent with valve type problems. Um, a lot of the symptoms of, the, of both heart failures are very similar. Um, so rapid changes in weight. Um, so we specifically, with patients with heart failure, we ask them to watch out for weight gain um, and to look at trends. So looking at three pound weight gain in one day is going to be a sign that your heart failure is worsening um, and that you need to reach out to your, your healthcare provider to try to change some medications or maybe we, maybe work with your fluid restriction or your salt restriction to try to decrease that weight. Um, that weight is specifically fluid that is on your body. And the more fluid that your heart has to pump, it 
makes it harder and it makes the heart failure worse. That extreme tiredness or weakness, um, because of the fact that the heart can't pump effectively, that's what causes that tiredness and weakness. Um, also, that swelling in the ankles, legs, and feet, or sometimes even in the stomach, you can get that swelling, and that's related to that fluid buildup. Um, so you may see the um, the changes in the swelling as the same time that you're seeing um, the weight changes. Also, if you're not maybe seeing the weight change in three pounds in a day, you may see it in five pounds in a week. That's also concerning. Um, and we want to make sure that we're telling our healthcare providers about that so that we can make changes. Uh, feeling lightheaded. <laughs> um, feeling lightheaded or can is um, is caused by the heart not being able to pump enough blood to the lungs. Um, and that can make the um, oxygen level go down. Um, rapid or regular heartbeat. Um, so that's that atrial fibrillation. Um, and that is often caused by heart failure. So if the heart is weak and it can't pump as well, um, then uh, the electrical part of the heart can also get thrown off. And that's what ca can cause that atrial fibrillation. With that atrial fibrillation too, it's kind of like a cycle because with atrial fibrillation, you're not getting as strong as a beat because it's not pump, it's not uh, beating regularly. Um, so that irregular heartbeat also contributes to the heart failure worsening. And then of course that sharpness of breath is related to that feeling lightheaded um, with the blood not being able to get to the lungs appropriately. Um, this kind of condition affects over 6 million Americans and is the leading cause of hospitalization for people over the age of 65. Um, it is a chronic condition. It doesn't go away, um, but it is manageable. It's manageable by um, treating blood pressure, by treating those rhythm disorders, um, by taking medications that decrease the fluid volume in your body, which we call diuretics. Um, also, you can manage it with your diet. Um, so decreasing the fluid intake, decreasing the salt intake, and then avoiding healthy or alcohol or drug use is also extremely helpful. Um, so that heart attack and high blood pressure are the key uh, common causes of heart failure. Um, and if you have had a heart attack in the past, talk to your heart, your cardiologist about the risk of developing heart failure or if you already have been diagnosed and what you can do to treat that and stay out of the hospital. Um, there's a lot of great outpatient options um, to keep you out of the hospital, um, such as a diuretic clinic that we have here at Tucson Medical Center. Um, and you can also work with your healthcare providers to just increase those medications while you're at home and try to avoid coming into the hospital. So I did talk about some of those online resources. Um, my favorite is that Cardio Smart. Um, there's a lot of really great topics specific to women and heart disease, and they have those flyers. Um, they do also have an app um, that you can pull up on your on your phone. Um, it's also a good. Um, it has a good web page if you don't like looking at on the phone. Um, that has a lot of really great resources. It has videos um, and ways to help to reduce your risk and treat your heart disease. Um, a lot of these other websites are related to that Cardio Smart, and they're from the American Heart Association um, or from the American College of College. College of Cardiology, um, so that AmericanHeart.org, GoRedForWomen.org, and Health Heart, HeartHealthyWomen.org are some of my favorites um, that you can take a look at. I also included um, that CV risk calculator down there as well, um, and that's how you can uh, calculate your 10-year risk score. Something that you can talk about with your um, with your health provider, either at your primary care or at your cardiologist to learn more about what you can do. Um, and that e-hack, that early heart attack care is um, to make sure that you're not ignoring those atypical type symptoms. Um, and that's all I have for today. So let us know what questions you have. And thank you so much.
Thanks so much, Brittany. I actually wanted to just uh, maybe put in a plug also for our Women Heart Support Group, um, since it is geared specifically for women, and it does happen on the fourth Wednesday of each month. So if anyone is interested in um, joining that group and has been affected by heart disease, please give us a call. The number is 520-324-1960. Three, and it is meeting online right now uh, over Zoom. So if that's something that you're interested in, please give us a call. We'd be happy to get you registered for that. Um, I had a question come in, Brittany, about calcium buildup. And yeah. so what causes that calcium buildup in the arteries and how can somebody prevent that? Yeah, so calcium buildup is something that is caused by plaque buildup. Um, so when plaques form, originally they're made out of cholesterol. Um, and over time, they actually harden. And um, calcium comes into the bloodstream and it actually hardens that plaque and it becomes like a kind of like a cap on top of it. And then slowly over time, um, all of that plaque turns into calcium in that blood vessel. Um, that calcium is really hard. Um, and so it's difficult to treat with stents. Um, and the way to prevent that is one, um, early on is trying to prevent you from developing those plaques in the first place. So lowering cholesterol, um, eating heart healthy diet, um, and then as far as knowing if you have calcium in your body, in your coronary arteries especially, is helpful. Um, so that CAC CT scan is a, is a test that your doctor can do. Um, and they can see how much calcium you have in your body currently. Um, if you do have a lot, they can put you on um, cholesterol lowering agents such as statins to try to lower your risk for developing more of those of that calcium buildup. Okay, and can you explain maybe the difference between what what a men and women experience? Um, what the symptoms? Which symptoms are usually similar when they have heart disease, and which ones may be different for you know for a woman? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so with men, a most common symptom is that crushing chest pain. Um, men usually complain of pressure um, and women a lot of times complain more of like a burning sensation or sharp chest pressure. Um, they may even not say that it's in their chest. It may be down below, like in your abdomen, and it's usually a little bit more sharp. Um, and that's a lot of times why it gets ignored um, is because it's not that chest pressure. Um, and it may be even that burning sensation that you may just think is the acid reflux is the most common one. Um, men and women both a lot of times have uh, pain that starts in their chest that radiates down to their arms. That's common in both men and women. Um, one of the differences though is that a lot of times men will say it's their left and women will say it's their right. Not really sure why it's so different, but that's something that we've seen a lot. Um, a lot of women will also complain of that jaw pain. Um, and it may be coming from the chest that is radiating up into the jaw, or it may just be in the jaw and that's it, is more common. Okay, that's interesting, especially about the arms and how yeah. it's different on, on men and women. Um, are there specific um, health disorders and, or concerns that women have that increase their risk for heart disease? I know you mentioned maybe lupus and some of those, but are there other ones that we should be on the lookout for as well? or? Yeah, so one of the most common ones is um, polycystic ovarian disease. Um, those, uh, those lots of cysts that develop, um, they can, um, they are related to like those hormones, um, which is also really um, similar to taking those oral hormones, um, which can increase the risk of developing clots. Um, those are specific to, to women. Um, and we talked about the lupus and um, and the rheumatoid arthritis. The lupus seems to be a little bit more common in women. Mm -hmm. um, and then also menopause. Um, so going into menopause, whether or not you're using hormone uh, therapy or not can increase the risk of heart disease. Okay. So key note, I guess uh, everybody should visit a cardiologist just for a check-in and, and to be sure that they um, don't have any 
risk that they need to be aware of as well from, from the sounds of it. Mm -hmm. um, I want to thank you so much for being here today. That was great information uh, for everybody just to understand more about heart disease and how it affects women. Um, and so thank you for being here. We do have another presentation coming up. Um, it is on Thursday. It is moving makes the difference for your heart health. Um, so we hope you'll be back to join us then. It'll be on Thursday, February 24th at 2 p.m. Thank you, everyone. And thanks for being here, Brittany. Thank you.